You've been given oil for one purpose, to keep your light burning, to keep yourself healthy, whole, and strong. If your fire goes out, you can't help all those others. If you're living depleted, drained, running on empty, you're not shining like you could. You're making it, but what could you be if you got back in balance? How much brighter, further, longer, happier could you be if you did like Jesus on an irregular basis, took time to get refreshed, to be replenished? I'm not saying to live selfishly. I'm not saying to not work hard. I'm saying take care of your temple physically, spiritually, and emotionally. You're not invincible. People may think you're Superman because you're so strong, so gifted. You're always up, but like all of us, you're human. You need to be refreshed. I look back at myself sometime and I think, what advice? <laughs> what would I tell that young guy in college who was on the verge of flunking out of that very same college? What would I tell myself? Well, I tell myself about forgiveness. I remind myself, I would teach myself to forgive a lot quicker, including myself. I held myself to my own pain for a long time because I kept rehashing those failures over and over and over again. And rehashing those failures, it prevented me from moving forward. So I would tell that 20 year old guy back then, be a little bit more forgiving of yourself and a whole lot more forgiving of other people's. To remember that Lord's Prayer that your mama taught you. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It would have made my way a lot easier. I would also tell myself to slow down a little bit. Don't go so fast. What you rushing for? Life is coming. I think this idea of loving yourself as a cultural obsession has no basis in reality. Now, here's the challenge. When you're born, what do you got to do to be loved? Nothing. Because your mother's on drugs. Uh, natural drugs. Oxytocin. So you look like a lizard and she thinks you're beautiful, <laughs> you know? You're fat, you sh** all over, you throw up and you're still beautiful, right? For a while, you're unconditionally loved. And thank God, we wouldn't have survived otherwise. You know, I'm, I'm so, I love women so much. I have so much respect for women, even more so going through birth again. No man will ever fully appreciate what a woman does or what a baby demands of a mother if you're breastfeeding and the energy and the no sleep. I mean, it's just, it's amazing what women do in our lives. But the point is, in the beginning, you got to do nothing. And then the oxytocin wears off. And suddenly you do the same scream or yell, throw your food. And now you get yelled at or hit or the worst one of all, you get ignored. And then fear enters your body. And then the rest of your life, you're looking for how can I get this unconditional love? And I remember in the beginning asking myself, because yeah, I studied all animals and with the level of dependency they have. And, you know, human beings have the longest period of dependency for survival of any creature other than other primates. Whales will be dependent for a year, birds for a few weeks, and boom, get your ass out there and fly, you know? It's a different world. We have this long dependency. It's just the nature of how we are. And then I thought to myself, so why, why don't we just have unconditional love all the time? And I think my answer is because then you never grow or give anything to life. You think everything is about you. And unfortunately, there are a large population of kids that were raised in a generation of parents that were helicopter parents that thought everything should be about the child, and they wonder why they're selfish today or why they, you know, don't seem to have great relationships where you gotta be with somebody else, you gotta put somebody else ahead of you. That's what love is. Love is putting somebody else ahead of yourself. Loving yourself usually comes for most human beings by starting to have a value and just appreciating people, not because of what they do, not because of what they have, just because you feel their essence. And it's easier to do that with somebody you love than it's with yourself, but when you start to with somebody else and you're not judging, you're truly loving them, then it's much more natural because you're already doing the loving. You're not getting it from somewhere else. Someone may say something, look you a certain way as a trigger, but all love is self-love. This bullshit, I don't love myself. If you've ever been someone who felt loved, you loved yourself. They didn't love you. They said something, they did something with their eyes, and you used that as a trigger to release love inside of you. But loving yourself every moment all the time is not the secret to success. Having appreciation for yourself is different than constantly loving. Now in the Bible it says, love thy neighbor as thyself. So I think it's a worthy goal and it's useful, but most people are obsessed with it. And I think, get on about living a life that's meaningful and you'll love yourself. As long as you focus on you, you're not gonna love you. Because the human brain is always looking for what's wrong, what to protect, what needs to be changed. It's a survival instinct. And so it's looking for things to fight or flight or try to freeze or pretend you're not there about yourself. But when you're in a bit of service, when you're trying to serve something more than yourself, that's when the higher part of your consciousness is there. That's when your heart is flowing. And when you're doing that, you're not thinking about you and therefore you feel love. And I can tell you my own experience, 
I, I don't have to, no one else has to earn love with me, but my strategy has been, I got to earn my own love, right? I got to be worthy of my own love. I don't do that to somebody else. How do you do that? Well, by helping millions of people for right. you know, 44 years, now I'm finally at the stage where, oh yeah, I fucking love myself. I'm out there, right. I enjoy myself, I appreciate it. But along the way, I've always earned it. Now, I don't think that's necessarily healthy or not, but I like what it's done with me. If I know people that just think they're God's gift to creation, and they don't add any value to any other human being, and they're assholes to be around. They love themselves. So I just, I would challenge that whole belief system. I'd say it's appreciating yourself. It's loving the people around you. And the more you can unconditionally love others, the more you'll unconditionally love yourself. But trying to start with yourself, when you're not doing with others, forget it, it'll never happen. One of my favorite p protocols is the daily nature walk. I love walking in the woods. I often listen to audiobooks in the woods. I call it walk, reading while walking. Reading while walking. So I go to this place, it's sort of my creative forest. There's not a lot of people in there and I walk for one hour. I breathe in the air. I look at the lush scenery. I listen to a different audiobook. I, it's almost like walking meditation as well. Sometimes I don't listen to an audiobook and I just walk and I touch the earth. It's almost like I'm thanking the earth, connecting with the soil. Yes, I'm wearing shoes. I don't want to get too esoteric here, but there's a lot of really good research saying if you want to boost your immune system, you want to boost your happiness, you want to release serotonin and dopamine, you want to release the fear hormone called uh, cortisol, walk in nature. And so when I walk, I connect with nature. Happiness is one of the most studied areas of human endeavor in the history of the world. I mean, when you look at psychology and you look at philosophy, this is all I've been talking about for literally centuries. It's unbelievable. So we've figured out the basics of happiness. It's that sometimes common sense isn't common practice. So people struggle for no reason. I mean, look at what we know about happiness. You know, we know basically happiness usually comes from an orientation towards the world in which we look at the, the past, the present, and the future in specific ways. We often tend to look at the past with gratitude and with fond recollection. Even if there were struggles, challenges, suffering, turmoil, we find our places in the past and we feel a sense of acceptance about the past, it happened. It's good. All things were as they were and today they are as they shall be. And it's being okay with whatever the past is, finding a peace and acceptance and a gratitude there allows us to be a little more free in the present. And being in the present, what makes us happy? Being engaged in whatever we are really doing. I mean, really engaged in it, mentally engaged in what we are doing each day. You know, where we're challenging ourselves just a little bit, you know, where we're finding something we're passionate about, interested in, and challenging ourselves to bring our full conscious presence to the moment to develop awareness, right? Almost all spiritual uh, sort of texts and teachers and trainers are always trying to help people become just more present in the moment, more accepting of the, as, of the world as it is, but here, you know, the power of now stuff, right? It's like, get here, be here, be engaged, be present with the moment. And then with the future, it's all about anticipating with excitement what's to come in the future. Even if the future is scary, even if you know there's still gonna be hardship because there will be, even if you know there's gonna be struggle, yep, there will be too. But finding your marks, what are you excited about for tomorrow? And if you can't find anything to be excited about tomorrow, that has nothing to do with the reality of tomorrow. It has to do with your mindset. You've poisoned yourself in pools of pessimism for so long that you've drowned yourself of hope that you've forgotten that there is magic to life, that there is something tomorrow, you could find something. Even if tomorrow you're just gonna say, you know what, tomorrow I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna feel better, just gonna decide to be. Be excited about that. You know, tomorrow I'm gonna go do something nice for somebody. Tomorrow I'm gonna get focused into this one project I've been waiting to do. Tomorrow I'm gonna make the damn bed. You know, whatever it is, find something to be excited about for tomorrow. That's the basics of everything we know about your emotional world and your mental world of happiness. So simple, right? be accepting at peace with the past, be present and engaged here in the present, and be excited, anticipate something for the future. So me and Jada was reflecting about love. And I asked her, I said, what did she think was, you know, one of the biggest revelations that she had had about love? She said that you cannot make a person happy. 
And I thought that was a real deep idea. You can make a person smile. You can make a person feel good. You can make a person laugh. But whether or not a person is happy is deeply and totally and utterly out of your control. I remember the day um, I retired. I literally said to Jada, that's it. I retire. I retire from trying to make you happy. I need you to go make yourself happy and just prove to me that it's even possible. And after we cracked the hell up, um, we started talking about we came into this false romantic concept that somehow when we got married that we would become one and what we realized is that we were two completely separate people on two completely separate individual journeys and that we were choosing to walk our separate journeys together. But her happiness was her responsibility and my happiness was my responsibility. And we decided that we were gonna find our individual, uh, internal, private, separate joy and then we were gonna present ourselves to the relationship and to each other already happy, not coming to each other, uh, begging with our empty cups out, uh, demanding that she fill my cups, the cup, and demanding that she meet my needs. Unfair and it is, it's kind of uh, unrealistic and can be destructive to place the responsibility for your happiness on anybody other than yourself. I have a philosophy about long-term relationships that isn't discussed very often. So for those of my friends that are in one that's, I, I don't know how long, but for some people long-term's a year, right? But for those of us that are in long-term relationships, I get asked often on shows, hey, what are, one of the, what are one of the keys that I would not normally hear about that create a relationship that is still doing what you said earlier, which is so wonderful, where there really is this observation, there's separation, there's growth happening. And so there's all these things they say in a long term. Be honest with one another, you know, be trustworthy, make sure you're communicating. One of the things that I find with my friends and I who have had long-term really good relationships is physical intimacy still. Mm. And real attraction to one another physically. If you're, you know, everyone says, I want to marry my best friend, which you do. But you have a lot of friends and you don't need to be married to all of them. And one of the things I see in relationships is they start out where there's this physical chemistry. And I know relationships ebbs and flow. I'm not just talking about sex. I'm referring to physical touching and intimacy. When I was dating Christiana, her dad was older than her mother. And it was his second marriage. His first wife had died of cancer. And oftentimes in second marriages, I see people kind of know the second time around, maybe the mistakes they made the first time. In his case, his wife had actually passed away. But I would date, when I would date her, I would often pick her up. And when you'd walk up to their home, their front door, and I'd knock to come get her, you could see into their living room. And my family didn't have this. My parents have their own dynamic. But I would, I would go to the front door, and more times than not, Matthew, more times than not, not every time, on a Saturday night, I'd come to pick up my girlfriend for a date. I could look into the living room, and the TV would be off. I get emotional because he's passed away, but they'd be slow dancing. Wow. And, and at an advanced age. Wow. They just slow dance in the living room together. Now, I don't know if that led to more than that in the bedroom afterwards, but they had real physical intimacy. They weren't just friends. They were lovers in every sense. Physical lovers. That doesn't always necessarily mean. But people ask me, what's this, one of the keys to relationship? Physical intimacy. It's a box you better be checking. There's got to be that touching and that physical attraction to have a passionate relationship. And I reached a point senior year when my adjustment felt like me. I, I had actually convinced myself that I was this person and she, me. Pretty, talented, but not stuck up. You know, a girl who laughed a lot at every stupid thing every boy said. And who lowered her eyes at the right moment and deferred. Who learned to defer when the boys took over the conversation. I really remember this so clearly and I could tell it was working I was much less annoying to the guys than I had been they liked me better and I liked that this was conscious but it was at the same time motivated and fully fully felt this was real real acting 
I got to Vassar, which 43 years ago was a single-sex institution, like all the colleges and what they called the Seven Sisters, the female Ivy League. And I made some very quick but lifelong and challenging friends. And with their help, outside of any competition for boys, my brain woke up. <laughs> I got up and I got outside myself and I, I found myself again. I didn't have to pretend I could be goofy, vehement, aggressive and slovenly and open and funny and tough and my friends let me. I didn't wash my hair for three weeks once. <laughs> they accepted me like the velveteen rabbit. I became real instead of an imaginary stuff.